All right, thank you very much, and thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I'm going to be talking about joint work with uh, several collaborators, Christian Gates, uh, Stefan Fannerer, Oliver Pachanik, and Josh Swanson. Josh is going to be giving a talk this afternoon um, related to this topic, so if you like it, feel free to uh, learn more at his talk, um, or if you don't like it, you can see his perspective instead of mine. Um, but <laughs> anyway, so I will talk about all the things in the title, um, but what I want to start with is a slide that has appeared in most of the talks I've ever given um, about some of my favorite combinatorial objects, which we have thankfully seen already um, in this workshop, so I don't have to talk about them too much. Um, and I really have to restrain myself from telling you all of the wonderful things I like and I'm frustrated by um, with these matrices. But I'll just tell you a couple, and then we'll get to the six vertex configurations and beyond. Um, so here's kind of the obligatory slide. We like alternating sign matrices because you can count them. Um, and the proofs of um, this counting formula were all very different and very insightful. Um, and one of them leads us to the six vertex model. Um, but since I had extra space on my slide, I thought I would tell you an open problem that's been bothering me for the better part of a couple of decades. Um, and it is, if you do as we like to do in combinatorics, sometimes we like to QFI counting formulas. And then it turns out that this is a, a recipe for writing down a polynomial. And we don't know any statistic on alternating sign matrices that gives us uh, this polynomial as a generating function. So if you can figure that out, uh, let me know. Yes. Is it clear why this is a polynomial? Um, no, but it's true. It's true. <laughs> so no, you're right. it, doesn't, it doesn't look like a polynomial. Um, all right. What? You said it's true. It what is, is true? true? Uh, uh, this is actually a polynomial. Oh, okay. Um, all right. But some other things that we love about alternating sign matrices is they're in bijections with, uh, bijection with a lot of different things, most of which we've already seen in this conference. So here are the bumpless pipe dreams that Anna showed us. Here are the monotone triangles that Hans showed us. Here's the height function that Paul showed us, except, you know, it looks a little less pretty. I don't know how to make those 3D um, height models. Um, here's a fully packed loop. This hasn't shown up yet, to my knowledge. Um, and then here's one of my favorite ways of looking at them as order ideals in a tetrahedral post set, which, you know, we saw this talk about, like, excavating a, a tetrahedron. I mean, this is the tetrahedron, um, just drawn a little bit differently. Um, so anyway, we love all of these bijections. Here's another picture that kind of puts several of them on one uh, slide. So there's the height function, the fully packed loop, and the, um, the order ideal of the tetrahedral post set. So anyway, um, uh, so we, we like all of these bijections. But the bijection that I haven't mentioned yet is the bijection to the six vertex model, which we saw in the talk of Anna. Um, and so she even drew the H's and the O's, so that's, <laughs> that's uh, really fun. But the H's and the O's are really hard to draw. This is the only one I've ever drawn. Um, so we mostly represent these models with arrows. And um, as we saw before, there are six different vertex configurations allowed. We always have two arrows in and two arrows out. And the bijection says that all of these um, things here are, uh, correspond to the zeros in your uh, matrix. And all of these, I will call these transmitting vertices, where you have um, the arrows are going in the same direction, um, horizontally and vertically. So all four of those have that property. And then the one has these arrows pointing in on the sides and out on the top and the bottom. And the thing corresponding to the minus one has the arrows pointing in on the top and the bottom and out on the sides. And I would like to observe that it really matters if you, that you know which way is up in which way is left, and which way is right, and which way is down, in order to be able to distinguish between these two different uh, vertex configurations. So most of the work that I've seen on the six vertex model has uh, studied it in a square grid, um, you know, maybe, maybe a rectangle, but like in situations where you always know where the top um, and the bottom and the left and the right are. Um, though I did talk to Jan a few days ago, who told me about a paper of Baxter uh, called Perimeter Beta Ansatz, where he was looking at things a little bit more on the circle. So um, I would like to look at that a little bit more. Um, but uh, what we want to do here is be able to look at um, six vertex models um, on more arbitrary domains. So I'll show you our, um, the way we're going to look at that shortly. But first, I um, wanted to mention a few um, times we've looked at, uh, uh, various authors have looked at alternating sign matrices on more general domains than just the square. So um, it was mentioned in a prior talk about symmetry classes of alternating sign matrices. So you can look at alternating sign matrices that are um, 
reflection symmetric or rotation symmetric or something. Um, and so those would be really instead of, it doesn't go with this picture right here, it's a fun picture though, but um, symmetry classes of ASMs would really be, you know, you're going to cut the ASM into some other smaller domain and think about the six vertex model on that domain. Um, also, fully packed loops on general domains were studied by Cantini and Sportiello um, in their series of papers uh, proving the Razumov Stroganov conjecture that related uh, the ground state um, O1 dense loop model with uh, fully packed loops. Um, and then this picture I have here, this is some work that I did with my very first uh, graduate combinatorics class at NDSU. Um, and we studied chained alternating sign matrices. So here is a picture of an alternating sign matrix on um, actually a three person chessboard, which I gave them when I went on a conference and told them to tell me something about rook placements on it. So we studied permutations on boards like these. And then, you know, why not? We studied alternating sign matrices on boards like these. And what we did is we were really looking at a whole bunch of n by n boards chained together um, in a way that we want. So the alternating condition on, on alternating sign matrices says the ones and minus ones need to alternate across a row or a column. So here we're looking at, say, rows and the condition needs to keep holding um, on the next column. So we're chaining together the rows um, with the columns on the next board. And we even did a bunch of bijections. So we wrote down what this would be in terms of the six vertex model. And you notice we had to be kind of careful about uh, you know, which arrows were pointing up and which arrows were pointing down in order to get our bijection to the um, chained alternating sign matrices. So I want to show you what, yes. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to think of that as like, um, I guess, six vertex model on a Mobius strip or a uh, torus? Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, here, we're mostly just thinking about it like on a circle that ends up coming together as this hexagon, but I didn't have the picture of the six vertex model on the hexagon drawn, so I didn't have that here. Um, but yeah, you could certainly do something a little bit more general here, um, and that could be interesting to study. Um, all right, but I want to, so it is very, so these domain wall boundary conditions um, on the six vertex model are very uh, particular. They're the things that give you alternating sign matrices. Um, so typically we have arrows pointing in on the sides and up and down on the top and the bottom. So what we're going to do for this work is uh, make it so that it doesn't matter which way is the top. What we're going to do is turn around all the vertical arrows um, so that now all of the arrows in your boundary conditions are pointing inward. Um, and so that has, so I'll go back and forth a little bit. So here's what the one looked like before. Now notice when we flip the arrows around, this is actually a sink of the graph. So you know that it's a sink no matter which way you look at the graph. Um, and then the minus ones turn into sources. And then everything else, uh, what this did is it just it permuted all of these transmitting vertices. So, you know, that change doesn't matter quite as much. Okay, so this is what we're going to call the symmetrized six vertex model because, um, it makes it so that your boundary conditions, you know, in the case that you get the alternating sign matrices, are all uh, symmetric. They're all pointing in. Okay. Um, all right. So with this definition, we can now draw pictures like this. Um, so here is a symmetrized six vertex configuration on a graph. And notice um, we require that the, gra the internal vertices of our graph all have degree four, so that we can have one of those um, six vertex. Uh, configurations like the sources, the sinks, or the transmitting vertices. Um, but now we've kind of drawn this on a circle. Okay, so we'll just define that a symmetrized six vertex configuration is a planar graph embedded in a disk with all internal vertices of degree four, all boundary vertices of degree one, and each internal vertex, I should have said, is a source, a sink, or a transmitting vertex. What does transmitting mean? So oh yeah, so I side. defined that here. It just means, I, I guess we use this word because it's like the arrows just kind of transmit their way through the vertex. I understand, but, there, but on a general graph, there's no horizontal or vertical. Right, so actually all four of these things are like the same um, here, right? You can just look and see, oh, there are some, like here's a sink, and then here is a transmitting vertex where the arrows are just kind of going straight through. So you pick the alternating, I mean, you pick incoming, outgoing, incoming, outgoing. Oh, no. No. Anything that's not a source or sink. Yeah, yeah. anything that's not a source or sink has to have this property that the edge that's coming in needs to exit straight across. And another edge that's coming in would, I mean, I guess you could think of it as like this too. But anyway, basically, yeah, in, in, out, out is what you could think of it as. Yeah. 
Okay, so now the question is, why did we define <laughs> this model? Okay, it was not to do any of the typical six vertex stuff that so many of you know how to do. So I invite you to do like six vertex, uh, vertex model stuff on this model. And I would love to know if there's like, you know, good, good uh, formulas for the partition function um, or interesting asymptotics or, you know, whatever, whatever you know how to do to six vertex models. It would be wonderful if you would like to do that to this. And I would be interested to know if it ends up being basically the same as the regular six vertex model or if you end up seeing something new. Um, but what I want to show you is what we did with these and how we came across them. We, I'm basically telling you the story backwards. Um, where we began uh, was by trying to solve an algebraic problem, which I'll describe to you shortly. But what we were playing with was objects that look like this. So this is an hourglass play bit graph. Pay no attention to the colors for now. Those will be meaningful later, but they're not really there. They're just illustrating a feature of this graph. Okay, so this is an hourglass play bit graph. Um, maybe I have the definition here. Oh, no, I don't. Um, so I will give you the definition shortly, but for now, uh, the reason that I have this big and in the same spot as the six vertex configuration is I want you to convince yourself that whatever these objects are, they look like they're in bijection with these six vertex configurations that I just showed you. Okay, so what's happening, uh, or the thing that you can notice is that all of these arrows that are pointing in here for a sink, that turned into an open circle, a white vertex in the middle of my graph here. So all the sinks do that. I don't think I have a source here, but if there were an honest source, um, it would turn into a black vertex. There's a source at 14, 15. Um, no, nope, that's no. a transmitting no. vertex. <laughs> Good. I, I'm pretty sure there's not a, a source here. I mean, I guess there are all these. Uh, what? 116. Nope, that's a thing. So that'll turn into a white vertex too. Um, uh, but, oh, I guess I, all of these, so you could think of all of these things around the boundary as sources, uh, and so those all turn into black vertex vertices, okay? Um, and then the thing that happens at the transmitting vertices is we really want the arrows to be pointing toward white vertices and away from black vertices. And here we have arrows pointing, you know, toward and away the same vertex, or from the same vertex. So what I want to do is replace this by two vertices, a white one and a black one, and we're gonna put an edge in between. And for reasons I'm not gonna tell you just yet, we're gonna make it a little hourglass, um, but that looks a little confusing. Um, so anyway, we're gonna replace it by two um, vertices, okay? So over here you see there's a, a white vertex and a black vertex. So in the six vertex configuration, we would have had um, you know, these arrows pointing into that white vertex and out from this black vertex, and in fact, that's the way the bijection goes. If you have a graph like this, you just put in all of these orientations and then you end up squishing all of the little hourglasses. And it will turn out that for the graphs that we care about, these hourglasses are isolated, so it ends up being well-defined. Okay, so we have some new graphs that we can study. And the reason we called these hourglass playbit graphs is because they are indeed playbit graphs. Um, so what is a playbit graph? And then our contribution was to add these hourglass edges and um, and look at them from that perspective. So a playbit graph is something um, defined by Posnikov. Um, it's a planar bicolored graph embedded in a disk with all boundary vertices of degree one. So uh, playbit graphs don't actually need to be bipartite, though the one I have on the slide here is because it's the one that shows up later in my talk. Um, but it's just important that it's embedded in a disk and it has two colors. Um, and these playbit graphs end up being very useful in the study of a lot of different things. Um, so cluster algebras, the totally positive Grassmannian, Grassmannian KP soliton. So if you're interested in, in all of this, uh, maybe ask Lauren about how uh, playbit graphs are useful. Um, all right, but then here is our definition of hourglass playbit graphs, and we're going to use a parameter r here as well. So it's it's just a playbit graph, but here are a few um, extra requirements that we have. Um, we want all the internal vertices to be of degree r. And uh, we want all the boundary vertices to be of simple degree one. I'll tell you what simple means shortly. And then whenever you have a multiple edge in between two vertices, we're gonna draw this with a little twist um, for reasons that I'll tell you later in the talk. Okay, so that's our definition of these um, our hourglass playbit graphs. Oh yeah, and then I have a few more pictures of some. So here's another one that satisfies our definition and this illustrates what simple degree one means. It means that around the boundary, um, you can have an edge that 
is itself an hourglass, that's fine. But around the boundary, you're not allowed to have um, two different edges um, coming out from the boundary. Um, and this one also illustrates that we don't necessarily need all of the boundary vertices to be black. Um, they could also be white. Um, then here's another one of higher degree. So this is a nine, I believe, hourglass playbook graph where every degree in the middle, uh, you have to count the hourglass edges with the appropriate multiplicity. Um, but you end up with a degree nine around each interior vertex. So this picture will show up at the end Sorry, of the talk confused. as well. So here, the boundary vertices are connected. I mean, I thought you said boundary vertices have degree one, so. Yeah, so sometimes we draw the circle and sometimes we don't draw the circle. The circle isn't really there. So the boundary vertices all have degree one. So don't pay no attention to the, the but, circle. But uh, can you go back to the previous figure, please? Yep. So yeah. the black one at the towards the bottom, this one has not degree this one. This one has degree three, but it has simple degree one. If you look at the underlying graph without the multiplicities, that oh, graph has yes. degree one. Okay. So that's what I mean. Yeah, good question. So is, is there any mathematical reason why you want to draw multiple edges as hourglass? Yes. Yeah. Yep, it's like the key to everything that we are able to do. So I'll, I'll get there. So thank you, good question. I mean, they do look really pretty, but they are kind of annoying to draw. So like we wouldn't have done it if there wasn't a reason. Um, all right. Okay, so and then here is our theorem, which I will spend most of the rest of the talk um, telling you what, what all the words mean and what problem we were actually solving. Um, but uh, so here it is uh, that, so I haven't told you what most of these words are. So I'll tell you eventually what contracted, fully reduced, and top mean. So certain hourglass playbook graphs, or certain, we'll call these well-oriented and top uh, symmetrized six vertex configurations, either set of these um, give a rotation invariant web basis for SL4. So first I'm going to tell you what this problem is that we were solving. What, what is a rotation invariant uh, web basis for SL4? And why would people want to have such a thing? Um, and then I'll go back and fill in uh, what all of these adjectives are that tell us which of these graphs are actually in our basis. Um, and what's going to be important is we are going to relate these graphs to Tableau. So this is the same theorem up here, um, but I've just inserted this Tableau in between. And as an upshot, we're going to get a bijection between Tableau and uh, sets of these graphs, which is really interesting to explore and will include a lot of our favorite um, objects, uh, such as alternating sign matrices and plane partitions and, and things of that sort. So pretty pictures on the way. All right, but first let's talk about Tableau just a little bit because we do need some Tableau combinatorics to help us out um, with this algebraic problem. Okay, so here's a standard Jung Tableau and I'm not gonna go over the definition um, completely, but we like standard Jung Tableau because we can count them. Um, and also I want you to think of a standard Jung, Jung Tableau as um, a partition that starts out empty and grows. Okay, so in step one we have this partition in step two, we add that box. And so this is just telling us a recipe for growing a partition. Okay. Um, here's another kind of Tableau. So this one is a lot more complicated and weird looking, but it's very similar to um, what I just showed you with the standard Young Tableau. Um, so we're calling this an R fluctuating Tableau. And it is very similar to lots of other kinds of weird Tableau people have studied. So if once I describe this, you, you say, hey, I wonder if it's this similar to this kind of tableau. The answer is probably yes. But um, anyway, so here's, here's how it works. We fix how many rows are going to be in our tableau. And then we start growing and shrinking our partition shape. So we start from the empty shape. And then we're, at, we're allowed to add more than one one in the same step as long as they're in different rows. So we're going to say the thing that the two partitions in our sequence differ by is a skew column. So step one, empty set. Step two, our partition, oh yeah, I was going to switch to uh, this. Here we are. Our partition is going to be one, one. So that's uh, recorded here. Now in step two, we're going to take away a box from the fourth row so that our partition, our generalized partition is now uh, one, one, zero, and then negative one. Okay, and then in step three, we're gonna add this box and this box but then we're going to add in a box here to get us back to uh, zero boxes in the fourth row um, and so on. So the bars indicate you're taking boxes away. The not bars indicate you're adding boxes um, or the unbarred numbers indicate you're adding boxes. And the important thing to look at here is by the end, we will end up with a rectangle. 
And it's the rectangular tableau that are going to be important. Okay. So what we're going to look at is some dynamics of tableau, which are going to relate to um, actions on these webs. And in order to have all the properties that we needed for these tableau, so this really is the right level of generality that we needed for this work. Um, and a lot of the tableau combinatorics uh, was not developed or at least not written down at the level of generality we needed. So we ended up needing to write a whole extra paper just analyzing these tableau. So if you're interested in you know, how do exactly any of these tableau algorithms work on the level of fluctuating tableau, you can look at uh, the paper with tableau in the title that we put on the archive last year. Okay, so one of the things that's going to be very important, which I'll just show you in the standard case because it's just easier to explain, but I will give you a picture in the fluctuating case as well, um, is promotion. And so this is an algorithm that um, many people are familiar with, but it's really fun, so I'll just show you uh, real quick. So we delete the one, and then we ask ourselves, which of these two numbers should move into this box? Um, and the answer is the smaller of the two, because that's what makes sense. You know, you don't want a three before a two in a standard young tableau, because one of the conditions is that you're strictly increasing in the rows and the columns. Um, so we keep doing this, and we keep asking ourselves which number from the right or from below should move into the box. And we keep doing this until our box ends up at an outer corner. Oh yeah, I went a little too fast there. Um, so then let's fill that outer corner with the next biggest number and subtract one from everything and we get a new standard young tableau. Okay, so here's a picture of what we just did. And you can see the blank box kind of moving around. And tracking what numbers move between the rows as we do promotion will be important um, for, uh, for, our, for our bijection with Tableau and these um, playbook graphs. Okay, here's just the picture of how this works on fluctuating Tableau. Um, and you can see it's just a little bit more complicated. So instead of blank box, like we still replace the ones with some blank boxes, but we'll just represent them as bullets. And now they can move into other boxes that have some numbers in them. Um, but they still eventually make their way here to an outer corner and get replaced by the next biggest number, and then you subtract one from everything. So the rules in here are just a little bit complicated, um, but you know they're not, they're, they, they are definable. So. Um, so anyway, this is promotion on a fluctuating tableau. Okay, and so here is a very important fact about promotion um, on tableau. If your tableau is a rectangle, Promotion behaves like rotation. And this is what I mean. I mean that promotion has a well-defined order. So for example, with this tableau, if you do that whole promotion process 16 times, you are guaranteed to get back to the same tableau you started with. And so that kind of looks like maybe we should try to draw a tableau on a disk so that promotion uh, ends up rotating that. And so that is going to be one of the things that we are able to do. Um, but it's also true, so, so this was a, a, a result of Heyman uh, for standard Tableau, and I think semi-standard. Um, but it's also true in um, this fluctuating case, okay? As long as the shape we end up with at the end is a rectangle. Okay, so the question is, what's so special about rectangles? Um, so one thing that's special about rectangles is they have promotion permutations. So these are um, new. Uh, objects associated to Tableau, um, defined by Hopkins and Ruby um, in 2022, and then we expanded on what they did um, by defining more of them. So they defined this first one, and we defined uh, R minus one of them for an R row rectangular Tableau. And so here's the reason that I went through the whole uh, promotion process, is it helps me tell you how to write down these permutations. Um, so if we look here at the promotion on standard young Tableau, we can ask ourselves what number moved from row two to row one when we did this whole process. What number? Four, right? So here the four, um, oops. Yeah, the four moved up from row two to row one. And so the first number in our promotion permutation one is four, okay? We can ask a similar question about what number moved from row three to row two. 14, yeah, good eye, um, right? So the 14, um, oh wait, oh, but our arrow, I was confused for a minute. Our arrows are going this way. All right, this 14 moved up to here. Um, and so the second, or the first number in promotion permutation two is a 14. And what the rest of these numbers do, and similarly for promotion permutation three, we can see that uh, 16 moved up. Um, 
from the fourth row. Okay, so that's the first number in each of these <laughs> permutations. And then, as we said, you can do promotion over and over and over again, and we are guaranteed to get back to the tableau we started with in 16 steps. So we're going to keep recording a number each time we do promotion, and that number is going to be, um, well, we can look at it here. So imagine we did promotion here, and we deleted the one, and the two would move up. So that means the second number here is actually not two, it's two plus one. Okay, because we did promotion once. Um, and similarly for everything else. So you can construct these promotion permutations, and I've drawn them here. Um, it, you know, you can draw a permutation on a circle. And you might have noticed that this first one and this last one look the same. And that's because, so promotion permutation one, we have one goes to four. So we have one going to four. Um, in promotion permutation three, we we have four going to one. So really, I should have drawn some arrows on these permutations down here, but it turns out that promotion permutation one and promotion permutation three are inverses of each other. And promotion permutation two, since we have a middle one, um, it's its own inverse, it's an involution. Yep. Is it easy to see why they are permutations? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, that's a... I was worried of just missing something off. No. Um, yeah, so here's, here's the A statement of our theorem about Tableau. Or about these, so it's true not only in the standard case, but in the fluctuating case. Um, so yeah, so the first thing, if it's rectangular, these exist. Um, they are indeed permutations. Um, so we can define more general things for other tableau that are not uh, rectangular, but they don't turn out to be permutations. So when it's a rectangle, um, that is precisely when you get a permutation. Um, and then this is what I just said about uh, something being an inverse of each other. So prom one and prom three um, are inverses of each other. Um, and these promotion permutations rotate basically by construction. So if you do promotion one step, and then you look at the promotion permutations of that guy, we will have just rotated these permutations around. Mm -hmm. Is it, uh, is this, uh, are your uh, fluctuating tableau in some special case the standard tableau? Yes. Yeah. What is that? Um, when they don't fluctuate, when they just grow, <laughs> um, when you don't have any negative numbers, yeah, and when you have one of each one of each number. So yeah, so this is a, a superset of, you know, the kinds of tableau you probably care about unless you uh, care about K-theory, I guess. But anyway, um, <laughs> so, uh, all right. Um, oh yeah, and then the other thing on this slide is if you only know the promotion permutations, you can reconstruct the tableau. Um, and that turns out to be, what you need to look for is actually these blue highlighted numbers. Um, you need to look for the anti-exceedances of these promotion permutations. So uh, 6, 5, 2, and 1 are all of the numbers in this permutation that are smaller than the index of that spot, right? So uh, this is spot 1, 2, 3, 4. All of these numbers are bigger than what I'm writing above, but these numbers won't be. So 1, 2, 5, and 6 are actually the first row of your tableau. And then similarly, you'll find eight numbers that are anti-exceedances here, and that will be the first two rows, um, et cetera. So you can reconstruct the tableau from the promotion permutations, even in the fluctuating case, um, but I've just told you the standard case because it's easier to explain, but it's not that much harder to do this for a fluctuating tableau. Okay, and here's the fluctuating tableau picture, in fact. So if you have, um, you know, not just one of each number, you should standardize, or we called it oscillatize, and then you can um, also, so that's what these are, are these promotion permutations. So then that ends up making uh, permutations as well. So anyway, here's the picture that goes with the fluctuating case. Um, all right, and so that's, so, so that was the tableau combinatorics that we're going to need. And now I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the background of this algebraic problem and how it's solved for two and three row tableau and then what our new solution is for four row tableau. Um, so um, the thing that I said is we're looking for web bases um, for SLR invariant polynomials. And so what those are, is you have a bunch of um, variables. You have R sets of variables, and you're looking at polynomials in those R sets of variables. And you're asking which of these polynomials are invariant under the action of SLR. So if you hit the whole um, matrix with all your variables by a um, matrix, an R by R matrix with determinant one, this change of variables ends up um, on, like if you look at the polynomial, it should be the same polynomial even with this change of variables. Um, 
So for a two-row tableau, um, or actually for, I, I have a picture of two-row tableau, but here, um, this is uh, the standard answer that relates us to tableau. Um, so for any R, uh, standard junk tableau will index a basis of this space of SLR invariant polynomials. And here's some like details on exactly what space it is for, for what I wrote down um, for the standard case. Um, but the idea is you take each standard Young tableau and you look at the columns. And each of those columns determines a two by two, or an R by R matrix, um, with the, the column index just being the numbers in the column and the row indices just being the number of rows that you have here in your tableau. So this standard junk tableau corresponds to this SL2 invariant <laughs> polynomial. And we also know the dimension of the space. The dimension is going to be given by the number of standard junk tableau, so the hook length formula. All right, so this basis is very nice for a lot of purposes, um, but it does have some, or at least one yeah. deficiency. Um, it's not rotation invariant, and this is what I mean. If we take all of our variables and we want to cycle them so that xi, um, let me see if I write this down, x i j goes to x i j plus one. If we want to just you know, cycle all of those variables, that ends up cycling the numbers in your tableau. And then you get not a tableau, right? Because the one turns into a two and the one, so this ends up being like, just add one to everything. And that's bad because you end up with like a one way over here. So that's not a standard junk tableau. So we would like to have a basis that takes, um, that, that behaves nicely under this cyclic action, right? We want to be able to take a basis element, apply the cyclic action to the variables, and get a basis element back. Okay, so in SL2, this is called the temporally lead basis. It says instead of taking um, standard junk tableau of two rows, look at the non-crossing matching and let that determine your um, polynomial. Okay, so instead of looking at a determinant with where one and five are together, we're going to look at a determinant where one and ten are together. So that's uh, this guy over here. So each of these arcs in the non-crossing matching corresponds to one of the two by two determinants. And so this is a different basis for the space of SL2 invariant polynomials, which has this nice property that if you rotate this, um, if you cycle your variables, which corresponds to rotating your non-crossing matching, you get another non-crossing matching back whose polynomial is in your basis. Okay, so the question is, is there such a basis in general? So beyond two row tableau. Um, and one thing that we would like this basis to do, which is true in the two row case, is that promotion on the tableau should be what corresponds to rotation on your diagram. Okay, so this is true for SL2. It's also true for SL3. So um, for three row tableau and SL3 invariant polynomials, we have a web basis. So this is the non-elliptic SL3 web basis of Cooperberg and then also studied um, in the paper with Kovanov and Cooperberg. Um, so they have some things they call SL3 webs, which are bipartite graphs embedded in a disk with interior vertices of degree three, boundary vertices of degree one, and no cycles of length less than six. So it's really just this last requirement that we haven't seen before. Um, so uh, all that stuff up there is, is stuff that was already in our definition of, say, our hourglass playbook graphs if r equals three. You know, there end up being no hourglasses. Um, all right, so th this was the basis that they have. And I, and I feel like whenever I read about this, I thought this no cycles of length less than three requirement was a little bit mysterious, um, or of length less than six. But it is true that promotion corresponds to rotation of these webs. Um, I missed what non-elliptic. Yeah, non-elliptic is the thing that corresponds to this no cycles of length less than six. Um, and it has some meaning uh, that I don't entirely understand. But yes, there, was, there were reasons they called it this. Um, all right, and then it's also true that if you have uh, basically a fluctuating tableau of, of standard type, which uh, Petrius called a generalized oscillating tableau, and I'm just writing fluctuating because that's the word I already introduced, uh, but she showed that promotion on these guys corresponds to rotation on more general um, non-elliptic SL3 webs with uh, you know, white and black vertices around the boundary. Okay, and so you, you may have noticed I stopped writing polynomials, okay? And so sometimes people ask me, what is a web anyway? And well, that kind of uh, depends on who you ask. But basically the idea is you're supposed to be looking at diagrams instead of polynomials. So in the non-crossing matching case, we had um, arcs that gave us two by two determinants. And that's really, 
you're really thinking about you know, putting these two column vectors together to take this determinant um, corresponding to that vertex. And that's the same thing that's happening with um, SL3 webs. And so the idea is we can draw pictures instead of looking at polynomials, because um, it captures all the information, and there is a recipe for turning them back into polynomials, and the polynomials are kind of ugly to write down anyway. Um, so we want to be able to manipulate the graphs instead of the polynomials. And here's just a more um, general SL3 web calculation, and you have these extra variables with like y's corresponding to the white uh, nodes around the boundary. But um, you know, anyway, the, the invariant you get with, for this web is what you get when you multiply this vector times that vector if I didn't make any um, mistakes. So um, anyway, webs are a thing that have been studied by many people. Um, and you know, there are a few different conventions, but the idea is like we, we didn't introduce webs um, when we were finding our web basis, but there are lots of webs. And the idea is you have to try to pick a basis of them for your space that has the properties that you want. So some of these papers include um, web bases for SL4 that, that have the properties that, that those people wanted to use them for, but none of them included this property of rotation invariance that was present in the SL2 web basis and the SL3 web basis that I showed you. Okay, so what we have um, as we're pursuing this SL4 web basis is we have a new tool um, introduced, or I mean an observation really of Hopkins and Ruby from a couple years ago is that webs are playbit graphs. And since these webs are playbit graphs, we can use tools from playbit graphs. So namely, there's this thing called the trip permutation. Um, so the trip permutation of a playbit graph says, okay, let's start at a boundary vertex. So let's say start at two, and we're going to take a left at a white and a right at a black and a left at a white, um, et cetera, until you get to another boundary vertex. So here two gets mapped to 11. So the second number in our permutation is 11. So you can write down this trip permutation, and the observation of Hopkins and Ruby, uh, the thing that they proved, was that this trip permutation from the SL3 web, or the thought of as a playbit graph, is really this promotion permutation that I already showed you for um, the tableau. So they said, actually, you know, so they figured out what the promotion, or what the analog of the trip permutation should be on the tableau side. Okay, and so that is, that has been a guide for us. We, we want this property for SL4 also. Um, so indeed, here is a restatement of our theorem with a few more combinatorial details. Um, so the things that are true about our web basis um, is it is rotation invariant because we have diagrams that you can rotate and get back a basis element. Um, promotion on the corresponding, so we have a bijection between Tableau and um, these and equivalence classes of these diagrams such that promotion over here corresponds to rotation of the web. And we have that there are trip permutations over here that correspond to promotion permutations on the left. So I've already told you what these promotion permutations are. Um, oh yeah, and then here's just another picture. On this slide, we're, um, we're just noting that, um, that this, all of these things are true for r equals two, three, and four. Um, so this is sort of a unified way to say um, all of those things. And once I tell you what these adjectives are, um, you'll see how that non-elliptic condition from SL3 is also included in these uh, requirements. Okay, but first I want to tell you about the trip permutations. Um, because I already told you about what trip one is. You take a left at white vertices and a right at um, black vertices. And that's what's going on with this purple path here. And this is where these um, hourglass edges really end up mattering. You need to twist the hourglass edges in order to get these permutations to go where you want to go um, so that they correspond to the promotion permutations in the tableau. Um, so you notice the purple uh, goes, let's see, left and then right. You go around this hourglass edge and you end up here so that the left is now going over to 13. And so we see that 9 goes to 13 um, in this uh, promotion permutation 1. And then the other trip permutations are just instead of taking the first left and the first right at each vertex, you go, you take the second left and the second right for promotion permutation three, or for promotion permutation two, and then for promotion permutation three, you take the third left and the third right. Anyway, so you can drive like a crazy person on these uh, roads and come up with some cool um, permutations that correspond to uh, what's going on with promotion on the tableau. Um, and then this is also a good juncture at which to say, um, 
something about how we proved this, even though I haven't completely characterized this for you yet. Um, the way we prove this bijection is um, we have maps in each direction. The map from the tableau to the web says, OK, well, let's write down uh, the word, the lattice word associated to this tableau, which just records in which row is each uh, number. So uh, for example, 8 is the first number in row 3. So the eighth spot in this word is a 3. So we write down the lattice word corresponding to the tableau. And then we have some rules for growing the web out of this. So for instance, if you see a 1 and a 2 with the right witnesses beside it, they should come together and make a, a white vertex there, which is what we see here. If we number, um, if we number around uh, by this lattice word, 1, 1, 2, 2, um, we see that this 1 and this 2 do indeed come together in a white vertex. So we have some rules for growing the web from, um, from this lattice word on the tableau. And this is similar to what is um, true in SL3. There are web rule, uh, growth rules. Um, but ours are much more complicated because these webs get very, very complicated. So we have like, I don't know, 88 or 103 rules or whatever, depending on how you <laughs> count. And for SL3, they only had like 12 rules um, or 16. So anyway, so that part of our paper is very complicated. Um, but it has some non-trivial connections to crystal theory, which are very interesting as well. So um, anyway, we are able to prove that these growth rules do always result in a web of our uh, definition. Um, and then the backwards map, I think, is um, really fun. You can either do what, what I already showed you um, of, well, let's write down all the trip permutations and then use these anti-exceedances to give us the tableau. That's the most uh, straightforward way. Um, but to prove this, uh, we also look at the separation labeling, which is easy to describe here, um, given, or at least for right here. So for each, um, we are able to label each of these edges with the right number by looking at, okay, so here's the base face that's in between one and the highest number. And let's look at this edge right here and try to figure out what this label should be in that separation labeling. Um, what we do is we look at these three trip permutations through the edge. And we ask ourselves, which ones of these separate this face from the base face? Oh, and we have to be looking at the face where white is on the right. OK, so this edge where white is on the right is given by that star. And we ask ourselves, which of these three paths we've drawn, which of the trip permutations separate us from the base face? So there's three of them. How many of them separate this spot from the other spot? Two, right? The yellow one and the blue one separate us, but not the purple one. OK, so the, the possibilities are 0, 1, 2, or 3. All right, so we're just going to add 1 to however many things separate us from the base face. And we'll get the number 2 here. Um, and we see, uh, oh wait, no, but add 1. 2 plus 1, 3. Oh, good. And we see that 9 is in the third row. OK, great. Um, so there's this nice way to write down the, the um, labels corresponding to the edges. And in fact, this will result in a proper labeling of your whole graph. So you can start getting these labels just by, you know, if you get some of them by the separation labeling, then you can start doing like Sudoku and drawing all the rest of the, the labels. So, you know, if you're looking for something fun to do, you could pull up our paper and, and do this yourself on this graph. It's very, very uh, fun. Um, all right, so now I'm finally ready to tell you about um, all those adjectives in front of the webs. Okay, and so these have to do with certain moves on webs. So one move is contracted. You want to make sure that um, your graph is as uh, contracted as possible. And this is an analog of a move that comes from playbit graphs. So this, in particular for r equals 4, tells us that for our uh, web basis, we don't want two hourglasses in a row. OK, so this is what tells us that our hourglasses are always isolated. Um, and then we also have a whole bunch of really cool moves. So um, I'll draw a line here. So the benzene move is on the left, which looks an awful lot like the twist of a dimer cover around a hexagon. And indeed, it is, does correspond to that. And then all these guys over here are the square moves. The square move is something that shows up in webs. Um, and the nice thing is it doesn't change the polynomial. So if we're trying to figure out a, base, a basis web, it really doesn't matter which one we choose in this square move equivalence class. It does matter which one we choose in the benzene move equivalence class. But just like, um, well, you can always 
do as many of these moves as you need to on all of the hexagons that are there in order to get everything in one of these two configurations. Okay, so that's what top means. Okay, and then fully reduced. For r equals 4, this means that no graph in this move equivalence class has a 4 cycle containing an hourglass. So here are some um, pictures of 4 cycles that contain hourglasses. And all of these are bad. And they're bad for uh, reasons that I didn't write on the slide, but um, you can see the purple and the orange are these trip permutations. And they're all doing bad things. We don't want them to have bad crossings. So uh, we have a, a way to describe this in terms of um, the trip permutations as well. Okay, but in general, these, these trip theoretic uh, arguments imply that the sum of the multiplicities around a square must be at most r, which explains why in r equals 3, we could not have a square, because the sum of multiplicities around a square would be 4, right? 1 for each of these edges, and 4 is bigger than 3. Okay, so this explains the, or this, you know, um, in r equals 3, this includes this um, non-elliptic condition of Cooperberg's webs. Okay, um, and then I wanted to tell you what all of these adjectives look like on the six vertex side. So here we have um, well-oriented, which means no loops or parallel edges, and every triangle is cyclically oriented. Okay, so we're not allowed to have a triangle that has like two arrows pointing um, toward the same vertex. So that's this one down here, well-oriented. Um, Oh yeah, and I should say what, the, what we called the moves here. So these are an exact translation of the moves I showed you before. So on the left, we have something that looks a whole lot like the Yang-Baxter <laughs> equation. So we called it a Yang-Baxter move, um, where you can pull these strands across a vertex. And on the right, we have the analog of all of those square moves, which now look like moves that um, show up when you look at alternating sign matrices in, say, their polytope, or when you look at um, the elements in the post set, toggling those elements in and out of the um, post set, or popping one of those height, height function peaks into a, a valley. So uh, that's what all these moves are on the right. And again, um, these moves on the right don't change the polynomial invariant, so choose whichever one you want. And on the left, do as many of those moves as you need to to get to your preferred uh, cyclic orientation. So can I ask, does yeah. it, can you say it in terms of height functions again, just on the right? On the right, yeah, so these are, so if you have that height function, you're just changing, you're incrementing or decrementing your number. Well, it, it's all increments, local increments yeah. or decrements. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right, and so now the final questions that we are going to ask is, we have our alternating sign matrices. What tableau do they correspond to? Um, and it turns out they correspond to this really nice tableau. So this tableau, in our bijection, corresponds to all the n by n alternating sign matrices. Okay, so here's a picture, and you know, we wrote down the lattice word. It's the one where you have all ones, then twos, then threes, then fours, uh, resulting in this tableau. Okay, but there they all are in their six vertex configuration, um, with lines in between them to indicate it has a nice lattice, well-studied lattice structure um, as well. So anyway, alternating sign matrices are webs. Um, also turns out plane partitions are webs. Uh, so here's a plane partition with the web drawn on top, which you can see directly looks like, you know, a regular dimer cover. Um, and then here's the tableau that goes with that, with, all, with the set of all the plane partitions. So it's a weird fluctuating tableau. So we needed these weird fluctuating tableau. And we can write down what its lattice word is around the boundary. Um, and then you can ask other interesting questions. Uh, like for plane partitions, I mean, yep. Uh, okay. I just wanted to make sure I understood this statement. Mm -hmm. You say this one tableau is in bijection with this set of plane partitions. Yeah. You're getting that set by applying the different modes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Apply the. You can. So all of, all of the things with all of the moves that you can apply here are co correspond to that tableau exactly. Yep. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, what happens if you rotate this web? Um, yeah. What happens if you rotate this web? You do promotion on that uh, on that tableau. Would that, would, that, would that be, again, diamond cover? Um, oh, yeah, what would that look like? Yeah, I think we picked the representative of this promotion orbit that looks the nicest in terms of dimer covers. But no, that is a great question. I would love to you know, look at exactly what that, that means. It would probably look like a you know, slightly different box. And yeah, I don't know. I haven't checked. But I, I want to like, go look at the computer and ask it. If, like, if B equals C equals A, then maybe it's rotation? 
Um, yeah, but it's not going to be a rotation of the whole hexagon, right? It, the rotation just like, you know, takes one, one thing to the next thing. But if you rotate it enough times, yes, sure, you're, you'll get to rotations of the hexagon. And that actually leads to the very last thing that I wanted to tell you about is you can also ask about symmetry classes of plane partitions and what webs go with those. Um, so what we looked at is basically all the combinations of these, including my favorite, which are totally symmetric self-complementary plane partitions. And this is uh, an example of one of those. And so with my graduate student, I'll show you a zoom in of this in just a second, but with my graduate student, Ashley Adams, um, we found what tableau corresponds to totally symmetric self-complementary plane partitions in a 2A by 2A by 2A box. Um, so it's this weird um, word right here where this last little bit, you can kind of interleave some fours and some three fours in a certain way. Okay, but here's the example is you kind of zoom in on the fundamental domain for these plane partitions. Because they have a lot of symmetry, you don't need the whole thing, right? The rest of the thing gets reconstructed um, using the symmetry conditions. And so this tableau corresponds to all the totally symmetric self-complementary plane partitions in an 8 by 8 by 8 box. Um, so here's the weird looking lattice word. And here's what the web looks like on top of the plane partition. And the idea here is if we were to write down the um, lattice word, you'd get all ones up here, you'd get a two, then this is a four bar because it's actually a white vertex and a two and a four bar, et cetera. And then along here, this is where things can change, right? Depending on how you add the boxes in your plane partition. So you're gonna get a bunch of different um, words along that boundary. Um, so it's a whole set of different um, words corresponding to different tableau that correspond to all of these um, totally symmetric self-complementary plane partitions. And we have other results for the other symmetry classes as well. So yes, I think it's going to be a really interesting, or it is a very interesting question to ask, okay, what tableau correspond to what combinatorial objects I care about? Um, and then one more thing, so this is something that Josh will show you more about in his talk, is uh, we also studied two column tableau of arbitrary length and found web bases um, for this in Pluker degree two, which is restricting to the two column tableau. And that's where this picture I showed you earlier came from. So this is an R equals nine um, tableau and Josh will show you a lot more um, about these in his talk this afternoon. Uh, so thank you very much.